Hello everyone, welcome to Box Office Receipts. I'm your host, Tyler Callahan, and we got a lot of news going on. We got the box office numbers, new movies in development, casting updates, streaming updates, and more. Let's start with the domestic top five. For the domestic box office, staying in first place is Wonka with 14.4 million for a total of 164.6 million. Opening in second place is the horror movie Night Swim with $12 million. In third place was Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom with $10.6 million for a total now of $100 million. Migration came in fourth place with $10.2 million for a total of $77.8 million. Fifth place was Anyone But You with $9.5 million for a total of $43.7 million. Sixth place was The Boys in the Boat with $6 million for a total of $33.8 8 million. Seventh place was the color purple with 4.7 million for a total of 54.6 million. And in eighth place was the iron claw with 4.5 million for a total now of 24.3 million dollars. So Wonka is still doing good and Aquaman the Lost Kingdom has passed 100 million dollars. The color purple is slowing down hard after its strong Christmas day opening. It seems the issue is that it had a limited audience and it could not get pa get the general audience to come out and watch. And look, 54 million domestic right now isn't too bad. The problem is with its really strong Christmas Day opening, if it had decent legs, we'd be talking about it getting closer to 100 million domestic. Anyone but you will pass $50 million and is looking to definitely finish now closer to 75 million. So this film has been a solid win for Sony. Uh, and for Amazon MGM, The Boys in the Boat has been chugging along, uh, doing pretty good, and is looking to finish around $50 million. As for the new release, Night Swim did okay, considering it got terrible reviews. Uh, yes, terrible reviews for horror films don't matter as much, but it is also getting bad word of mouth, with it being at 42% from audiences on Rotten Tomatoes. That ain't good. In China, Johnny Keep Walking came in first place with $22.4 million. For a total of 77.5 million. Second place was the Goldfinger with 8.5 million. For a total now of 45.9 million. Third place was I Did It My Way with 5.6 million. For a total of 31.4 million. And fourth place was Endless Christmas with 3.7 million. For a total of 87.5 million dollars. And in fifth place was Shining for One Thing, which earned 3.5 million. For a total of $92.7 million. Worldwide, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom earned another $30.3 million for a worldwide total of $334.8 million. At this rate, it will pass Black Adam in the next week or so. Two, at the latest, uh, Wonka earned $28.9 million for a worldwide total of $465.8 million. Migration earned $15.5 million. For a worldwide total now of 150.7 million. Night Swim did open in a few other markets as well, earning 5.7 million for a worldwide opening weekend of 17.7 million dollars. Anyone but you earned 5.4 million for a worldwide total of 58.4 million. And Wish is now at 209.5 million dollars worldwide. We had the Golden Globe Awards, and for the most part, the winners were not too shocking. Let's go over the film ones first, and then for TV, Oppenheimer was the big winner of the night, winning five awards, including Best Original Score, Best Director, Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Robert Downey Jr., Best Actor in a Drama Movie for Killian Murphy, and the film also won Best Picture for Drama. Barbie won Best Original Song for What Was I Made For, and the new award Cinematic and Box Office Achievement. Poor Things won Best Picture for Comedy or Musical, with Emma Stone winning Best Actress in a Comedy or Musical. Paul Giamatti won Best Actor for Comedy or Musical for The Holdovers. Divine Joy Randolph won Best Supporting Actress in a Comedy or Musical for The Holdovers. And Lily Gladstone won Best Actress in a Drama for Killers of the Flower Moon. Anatomy of a Fall also won two awards, winning Best Screenplay and Best Non-English Language Film. Also, The Boy and the Heron won Best Animated Film. For TV, Succession was the big winner, winning four awards, including Best Supporting Actor for Matthew McFadden, Best Actor in a Drama Series for Kieran Culkin, 
Best Actress in a Drama for Sarah Snook, and Best Drama overall. The Bear won Best Comedy or Musical Series, with Io Edibri winning Best Supporting Actress in a Comedy or Musical, and Jeremy Allen White winning Best Actor in a Comedy or Musical. Beef from Netflix and A24 dominated the Limited Series category, uh, winning Best Limited Series. Ali Wong won Best Actress in a Limited Series, and Steven Yeun won Best Actor in a Limited Series. Overall, besides those bombing and not doing a good job, the awards were good. Now, let's talk about some release date changes for uh, from Warner Brothers. They are moving Godzilla, X-Kong, A New Empire from April 12th to March 29th. At the same time, Bong Joon-ho's next movie, Mickey 17, has been removed from the release calendar. Deadline says this is due to changes in production due to the strikes, and we should get a new release date soon. I'm thinking probably end of summer, maybe early fall release, but let's see. From Lionsgate, the Michael Jackson biopic called Michael will start production at the end of January and come out domestically April 18th, 2025. Universal's handling the international distribution, but I would think for most markets, the release date should be the same or close to it. Lionsgate also announced that the next Guy Ritchie film, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, is set to come out April 19th. The cast includes Henry Cavill, Isa Gonzalez, Alan Richardson, Henry Golding, and Carrie Elwes from Sony. With Godzilla X-Con moving up now to the end of March, they have decided to move up Ghostbusters with Frozen Empire now moving from March 29th to March 22nd. Smart move. 20th Century Studios is moving up Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, taking it out of the Memorial Day weekend, and it will now come out May 10th. I think this is also a good move as well. Gives the film some breathing room. As an, uh, and then for Memorial Day, the big movies are now Furiosa and Garfield. For the upcoming South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas, we got word of what the lineup will be. The Fall Guy will be the big one, getting its world premiere there. Universal must think they have a hit here since its world premiere at the festival is just about two months before it hits theaters. Also from Netflix, uh, their upcoming adaptation of The Three-Body Problem will also have its world premiere there as well. At a BAFTA tea event in Los Angeles, Neff Campbell was asked by IndieWire if she would consider reprising her role as Sidney Prescott in the Scream franchise. And she wasn't against it. She said she was open to returning under the right circumstances. While she came back for the fifth installment, she did not come back for Scream 6, with it basically boiling it down to they would not pay her enough. So, if Spyglass wants to bring her back for whatever the next Scream movie would be, she's up for it at the right price. Which, considering how they've been handling... Scream 7, with all that going on, um, she should absolutely demand the highest price possible. Absolutely. Deadline has the exclusive on two casting updates. The first is that Zachary Levi is set to star in an upcoming action thriller movie called Hotel Tehran, which will be directed by Guy Mosh. Alicia Vikander is signing on to star in Rumors, an upcoming comedy film also starring Kate Blanchett. Bleecker Street has already bought the U.S. rights to the film for a release in theaters later in the year. TechCrunch is exclusively reporting that Disney is considering more layoffs at Pixar later in the year, with possibly up to 20% cut. As for why, this is part of the cut in spending on content overall. Hopefully, the layoffs don't happen at all, but we'll see. Mia Goth, T. West, and A24 are being sued by a background actor alleging that Goth kicked him in the head on purpose during the filming of Maxine. He also claims that after she kicked him and he went to the bathroom, she mocked and belittled him, and the next day uh, he was basically cut from the film. I believe it was, if I read it right, the, uh, his agent, you know, his ca casting office called him and be like, just don't show up anymore. I don't think this lawsuit will go anywhere, but who knows? Maybe it will, it'll, probably it'll just get settled out of court and that's it. In an update on Jonathan Majors, CNN is reporting that he has been dropped from 48 hours in Vegas. He was set to star in the film as Dennis Rodman. Deadline is also reporting that Lionsgate has left the project and it is now owned by its producers, including Phil Lord, Chris Miller, and Adida Sood. No word on if they plan to shop it around. Majors also had an interview with Good Morning America, and I don't think it really won anyone over. From Universal and Bloomhouse, the next Exorcist movie, The Exorcist Deceiver, is being removed from their release calendar for now. It was set to come out in April 2025, but David Gordon Green is no longer directing it, and they are currently searching for a new director based on Believer's performance uh, critically and at the box office, uh, which wasn't good. This was the best move, I think, for everyone. There were a few deaths this week, sadly, 
First, Peter Crombie died at age 71 after a brief illness. He appeared in a few shows and movies, including Seinfeld, Natural Born Killers, and NYPD Blue. Alec Mooser is dead at the age of 50 after committing suicide. He was on the ABC show All My Children and also had a role in Grown Ups as well. Aden Canto has died at the age of 42 after battling appendiceal cancer. He appeared in shows and movies including Designated Survivor, Narcos, The Cleaning Lady, and X-Men Days of Future Past. Thoughts and prayers go out to their families. May they rest in peace and fuck cancer. Bong Joon-ho is leading a group of South Korean artists in asking authorities to investigate the circumstances around Lee Soon-kun's death. The group is called the Korean Association of Solidarity of Cultural Artists, and they want an investigation into how the police conducted the investigation into Lee as they are looking to prevent a second death. From what's being reported, the police do have to explain a few things as to what happened. Uh, I'm not sure if it's normal to be interrogated for 19 hours straight over some drug use, uh, but that seems to be very excessive. In an update on the future of Paramount, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that Skydance is considering an all-cash bid for national amusements. Again, if they buy national amusements, they will get control of Paramount. They will have the controlling shares. It seems Skydance right now is in the lead to buy Paramount as investors were not too keen on Warner Brothers Discovery merging with them. Point Grey Pictures has signed a first look deal with Universal. Point Grey is the production studio or production company run by Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and James Weaver. The production company over the last few years has helped produce a lot of shows and films, including The Boys, Invincible, Neighbors, and This is the End. And then what I think was the big news of the week was Tom Cruise teaming up with Warner Brothers. They are calling this a strategic partnership with the actor and producer, and should be noted that this is not a first look deal. Typically, these are first look deals, you know, between an actor and a studio or a production company and a studio. This is not that. As part of the partnership, Cruz will work with the studio to develop and produce both original and franchise films. If we can get an edge of the power or two, that would be fantastic. Along with this, Cruz and his production company will have an office on the Warner Brothers lot in Burbank. Now, since this is not a first look deal, this allows Cruz to work with other studios as needed. So Mission Impossible 8 will still get made, obviously. He has the space film with Universal. He can still work on that if he wants. And there is another movie for Paramount, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I think this is a big win for Warner Brothers. Right now, it makes for a great headline, more than anything. Uh, but the reason I say that is between Cruz's commitment to at least Mission Impossible, he won't be filming anything for Warner Brothers at the earliest until the end of the year. So for Warner Brothers, the earliest to have any Tom Cruise movie ready to go is 2026. Now, I would think both Cruise and Warner Brothers have a plan in place on what films they want to make. But again, it's just going to take a bit of time before we see them. Here is what Cruise had to say about the announcement. Quote, I have great respect and admiration for David, Pam, Mike, and the entire team of Warner Brothers Discovery and their commitment to movies, movie fans, and the theatrical experience. I look forward to making great movies together. End quote. Now, that other film Tom Cruise is working on with Paramount is Top Gun 3. Shocker. Huck exclusively broke the news that the sequel is in development at Paramount, and as of now, Cruz would return, as well as Glenn Powell and Miles Teller. This doesn't really come as too much of a shock, because Top Gun Maverick is the second highest grossing movie ever for Paramount. Now, if you include Titanic, it's like, they partially own Titanic, but then Fox partially owns Titanic, but that would be number one. If you take Titanic out, this is the highest grossing Paramount movie ever, and it is the highest one domestically, topping Titanic. So the studio is definitely going to be looking to see if a sequel was possible. And it seems like Tom Cruise wants to do it. Clearly, they're, they're talking about it. So for the next few years, Tom Cruise has Mission Impossible 8, Top Gun 3, the NASA movie if he does get to space, and then whatever he works on with Warner Brothers. He's going to be very busy. There are new movies in development, with Selena Gomez set to star in a biopic based on singer Linda Ronstant. It'll be based on her memoir called Simple Dreams and will be directed by David O. Russell. In an exclusive from Deadline, Ben Wishaw is set to star in a film about photo artist Peter Hujar with Ian Sachs set to direct. Wes Anderson is starting to get his cast together for his next film with Michael Sarah, Bill Murray, and Bianco Del Toro set to star in it. No word on what the film will be about, but it is expected to start filming later this year. The Hollywood Reporter 
is exclusively reporting that 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later sequels are in development, called 28 Years Later, Danny Boyle is coming back to direct, with Alex Garland set to write the script. As of now, they are selling this to potential buyers as a package of three films, or what could be three films. Garland will write for all three, and Boyle will direct the first. These are some great zombie movies, and I was always hoping they'd make the, you know, what everyone kind of assumed would be 28 months later. But yeah, this is definitely, I think, a package that will get highly sought after. Over at Warner Brothers, Deadline is exclusively reporting that Paul Thomas Anderson is set to direct a new film starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Sean Penn, and Regina Hall, with production set to begin within weeks. If it's filming shortly, there is a small chance it could be done by the fall for award season. If not, it should be released sometime in 2025. In another exclusive at Deadline, they are reporting that Paramount is developing a prequel film to the theatrical Star Trek series. This is the series uh, led by Chris Pine. Toby Haynes is set to direct the prequel, with Seth Graham Smith set to write the script. Deadline is also reporting that Star Trek IV, which will be the final film in this series, is still in development. Adam McKay is teaming up with IMAX to produce a documentary called Stormbound. It'll follow Jeff Gammons as he chases storms. I remember something like this over a decade ago where there was these guys that would chase tornadoes around the country. It was like a show on like one of the cable channels. It was uh, pretty interesting. Apple Original Films and Skydance are teaming up again with Deadline exclusively reporting that they are working on a film called Fountain of Youth. The global heist film is set to be directed by Guy Ritchie and star John Krasinski and Natalie Portman. Sounds like it should be a fun film. And what possibly was the biggest new film announcement came from Lucasfilm and Disney as they are adding another Star Wars film to their slate. The Mandalorian is headed to the big screen with The Mandalorian and Grogu. I do hope they change the name for its final release. The new film will be directed and produced by Jon Favreau with production set to start later this year. No word on any casting announcement. This also looks like it'll not be a replacement for a fourth season of the show, with Deadline reporting that it is still in development. With production starting this year, it looks like this will be the first Star Wars film to come out, and will likely be in 2026. Personally, I don't mind the idea of seeing Mando and Grogu in theaters. I just hope after a disappointing uh, third season, this is a good story. The visuals and action in the show are already great. Throw some more money behind it, have a better story, and it's going to be great for the big screen. For trailers this week, we got only one, which is for Abigail. This is the horror movie from Radio Silence that was working on it for Universal, right? We all heard all of last year, you know, the casting updates, they're working on a horror film, Untitled from Universal. This is the one. We finally got a name for it and an idea of what the movie will be about, which is a group of kidnappers kidnap a girl for ransom. Turns out she's a vampire and she starts killing them one by one. Trailer was pretty good and I'm looking forward to it. It comes out April 19th. We start off VOD Premium, sadly, with job cuts over at Amazon. They are laying off several hundred people between Prime Video and Amazon MGM Studios. And while not directly related to what we talk about, uh, they are also laying off 500 employees over at Twitch as well. Along with this, Deadline is exclusively reporting that Prime Video is also shifting its focus in Southeast Asia by focusing more on licensing content than producing originals. They will not be ordering any new original shows or movies, current shows that are running or about to premiere will still be released. Due to this, some employees on a team based in Singapore have been let go as well. This is a rough way to start the year with layoffs, and it's not the only layoff story in this podcast. Hopefully all of those affected land on their feet quickly. Deadline is exclusively reporting that Topic Studios are laying off over 20 employees. They recently made a, the film Theater Camp. Hopefully they land on their feet as well. Over in the UK, ITV already has what might be one of the big TV shows of the year. Last week, they premiered Mr. Bates vs. the Post Office, which is about the true story of post office managers in the UK being attacked by the executives of the post office. Basically, they had an IT system that was saying there's a shortfall of money at certain branches. The executives took that information, went ahead and fired people they thought were involved in stealing money. Basically, there's a shortfall. The IT system's kind of pointing, hey, at this branch... There's a shortfall, and it kind of led to the executives being like, okay, so we know you're stealing because the system says so. Uh, so they went ahead and fired people they thought were involved. They pushed for prosecution of theft, fraud, and this led to many of those attacked to be left bankrupt, out of a job, and their reputation ruined. The issue is they never stole, and it was the IT system messing up. The show has caused a strong, renewed interest in the scandal over in the UK. That is just 
again, for basic context, I would recommend reading up on it. There are a lot more details about it. As for viewership numbers, the show has gotten strong views on TV and on their streaming service, ITVX. Uh, it has gotten so far 16.6 million views. This makes it ITV's biggest new drama show since the premiere of Downton Abbey back in 2010. So yeah, the show has become pretty important in the UK. And as for ITV, it's a smash hit. And it looks like it might cause the UK government to respond in a meaningful way. Canal Plus has gotten a approval from the antitrust board in France to acquire Orange Studio and OSC. Orange Studio is the production company owned by Orange SA, a French telecom company. And OSC is a group of TV channels also owned by Orange SA. However, for Canal Plus to buy the assets, they need to commit to a few things for it to go through. For OSC, the plan is to merge with Cine Plus, but they will operate independently, and that includes having separate budgets to buy content. Canal Plus also commits that both Cine Plus and OSC together will pre-buy 25 French films over the next five years. Also, Canal Plus has increased their ownership of Viva Play to 29%, this comes after they bought 12% of the company last summer. Viva Play has been in the middle of a recapitalization program to keep the company running. Viacom 18 have bought the rights to field hockey from the International Hockey Federation. So for streaming, Jio Cinema in India will be the home to all International Hockey Federation events besides the Nations Cup. The deal will run until 2027. On Apple TV+, Plus, they have a new British crime drama premiering called Criminal Record. It stars Peter Capaldi and Kush Jumbo. So far, it's gotten great reviews, with it at 90% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 73 on Metacritic. I'll definitely be giving it a watch. For AMC+, Plus, we got the first full trailer for The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live. Again, for AMC, this is the big one, as it stars the return of Rick Grimes and Michonne. It is set to premiere on February 25th. We now know when Oppenheimer will be available to stream, with it announced that it'll be on Peacock starting February 16th. Peacock has ordered a new show called Laid. It is a comedy, and it is an adaptation of an Australian series with the same name. Stephanie Sue is set to star in it. Paramount Plus released a new trailer for the second season of Halo. The first two episodes will come out February 8th, with weekly releases after that. And Mayor of Kingstown has started production on its third season. Jeremy Renner posted a photo on Instagram talking about it being the first day on set. This comes a year after he almost died from a snowplow last year. Uh, it's great to see he has made a strong recovery. Over at Disney, the Atlantic and Variety are reporting that they are in talks with the NFL on a deal with ESPN. As of now, the deal would include the NFL owning a stake in ESPN, and NFL media would become part of the sports broadcaster. A big goal for Disney this year is to get someone outside the company to invest in ESPN, as they look to launch a full ESPN streaming service sometime in 2025. Disney, for the first time, will be streaming parts of D23 on Disney+. Plus. The event is for the big Disney fans and happens once every two years. And for Marvel Studios, Echo is now available to watch on both Disney+, Plus and Hulu. So far, review-wise, it's good, with a 71 on Rotten Tomatoes and a 62 on Metacritic. Now let's see if people tune in to watch. We got the Nielsen Top 10 charts for the week of December 11th to the 17th. Leave the World Behind stayed in first place with another 1.95 billion minutes watched. Reacher came in second place with 1.68 billion minutes watched thanks to the premiere of the second season. And Young Sheldon came in third place with 1.42 billion minutes watched. Max has canceled two more shows with Julia and Our Flag Means Death Getting the Axe. Both shows lasted two seasons. Max has released a trailer for the second season of Tokyo Vice, with it set to premiere on February 8th. I really enjoyed the first season, and I'm hoping this will get renewed for a third, uh, but considering how many Max original shows have been cancelled, it is looking unlikely. Uh, I hope I hope for this I'm wrong. For HBO, we got a casting update for The Last of Us Season 2, with the big one being Caitlin Dever being cast as Abby. Along with that, Isabella Merced has been cast as Dina, and Young Mazzino as Jesse. So far, the casting has been great for the new characters. I'm looking forward to the second season. There should be a few more casting updates as well before they start filming. As part of the Mandalorian movie news, Lucasfilm also announced that a second season of Ahsoka is in development, which is good because based on how season one ended, uh, kind of needs it. And we wrap up with Netflix where Tina Fey is going back to TV. Deadline is exclusively reporting that she will star in the four seasons, which is a series adaptation of a film that came out back in 1981. 
The series is set for eight episodes, and she is co-creating it as well. Lawrence Fishburne has joined the cast of the upcoming fourth season of The Witcher as Regis. It'll be interesting to see how the show performs now that Cavill is not Geralt anymore. The fourth season is set to begin production in the spring. Netflix's advertising tier continues to grow, with Amy Reinhardt, president of advertising, saying they now have 23 million ad tier subscribers. Along with that, at an event hosted by Verity, she reported that over 85% of the ad tier subscribers are streaming Netflix for two hours or more every month. The streamer released a new trailer for the three-body problem, set to come out March 21st. And for their first big movie release of the year, Lift is now out. This is the heist movie with Kevin Hart leading an ensemble cast. Review-wise, it is getting trashed with it now at 28% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I can't say I'm surprised about. This was supposed to come out last year and it got delayed, which usually is not a good sign. And that's it for this episode of Box Office Receipts. If you want to follow me on Threads, X, or Facebook, links to those are in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.